holy gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. This is John chapter 2, beginning at the first verse. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, now fill the, the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. In the name of God, of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. It is good to see you here this morning. And we are embarking now on our journey, uh, reading over the 100 top passages of the Bible trying to get some perspective of the kind of the bird's eye view of the movement of God's work from the beginning um, to the end of, of this tremendous book that we have. And, uh, and so it would be a good thing as we are here at this very beginning part to be able to ask the question, you know, how is it that we come to approach this book? How is it that we come to it to pick it up? You know, there's no introduction that's inspired uh, about this book. I mean, there may be introductions in your Bibles, but it didn't come with the original thing. And so the, the way it is that we, that we approach this book before we even pick it up is a good one. Uh, we talked last week about the fact that, uh, that some people uh, could approach it, and, and we ought to approach it as a book of history. So the story of God's, of God's redeeming works. Um, so the, the events that happened in the lives of people in the Middle East thousands of years ago. That's a good thing. Um, it is also possible for people to, uh, to pick it up as a book of literature. And there are many uh, important standard setting passages of both poetry and prose that are, that are artistically um, beyond the pale, the kind of the classics in terms of being able to understand the history of literature and from which innovations have come since then, and that's true too. But there are lots of other kinds of ways and reasons that we have to be able to approach the Bible or not. Um, in some cases, we approach it because uh, it was a gift that was given to us, the family Bible at, the wed at our wedding. And so then we, it's, in a, it's white leather bound and it's in a box and we set it on the shelf of our closet. And it's a memento that continues to kind of sit there. You know, that's one approach um, to the Bible. Um, another approach is like the one that I ran into when I was in Nashville. Um, it was raining, drizzly on that weekend. And... Uh, and as people went out from worship on that Sunday, there was a crash, a collision that happened out at one of the intersections in front of the church. And nobody was hurt. Um, and so I went out to see if I could be of any help. And one of the members of our church um, was hit by another car that had, had gone through the intersection at a stop sign. And so everybody was, was kind of doing okay. And the person who was uh, the member of our church was getting his official documents out of uh, his glove compartment and coming, and I was directing traffic, directing the cars to kind of go around the crash. And, uh, and he went to the driver of the other car and, and asked if he could have uh, his insurance information to exchange uh, insurers. And the guy kind of looked at him and he said, well, I don't really have insurance on my car. And he said, oh, really? And, <laughs> and the guy says, no. He says, what I've got is that. And he pointed to his dashboard where in the center of his dashboard he had a Bible. He said, that's my protection. <laughs> and in my mind I'm thinking, well, that worked real good. <laughs> 
you know, if you'd read it, maybe you would know that you're supposed to get insurance. <laughs> So there are all kinds of ways that we have of approaching the Bible, uh, from a scholarly tome to uh, look for you know, uh, some kind of a rabbit's foot. Um, and yet, uh, as we come to approach the Bible, we approach it, as we saw last week, as God's word for us, God speaking to us. And he speaks his story to us, his desire, his outreach to want to have a relationship with us. So get this. So we have this sense that the God of all creation. Uh, so we live in this universe uh, that has billions of stars and billions of planets in it, and the God who created all of that wants to have a relationship with us. That'll blow your mind. So what does that mean? How does a God who is so absolutely powerful, absolutely knowledgeable, absolutely holy and righteous, how does that kind of a God have a relationship with us? That's the story of this book. And we can find from the beginnings of these pages that it pivots around a particular word, and that word is covenant. Covenant. To be able to have a relationship, a covenant. Um, in the Old Testament, the word uh, is the word berit, which means to cut. We continue to use that word, actually, in reference to it, in our own culture. When we talk about, you know, somebody sends you a bill, and we would say, well, let me cut you a check, right? So there's a, to cut a check, it means to seal the deal, the agreement. Um, in Old Testament times, around the cultures, uh, the nations, uh, during the times of the writings of the earliest Old Testament documents, there was a sense, a sense of covenant, a sense of treaty, a, a sense of what it meant for nations to be able to agree uh, about having a relationship together. And so there might be a powerful king, the pharaoh of Egypt, say, who uh, looked to this, uh, this smaller um, nation that was nearby, and this king wanted to be able to have a relationship with this, with this kind of this smaller nation. Um, he could take it over, uh, he could just move in and take over the land, but he didn't want to do that. He wants to be able to have a relationship with the people who are there. So he approaches that nation, the king of that nation sends emissaries, and he says, um, I'd really like to be able to have a relationship with you. Um, I think we can come to some terms on which we can have that relationship. And so if we do, then you can stay exactly where you are as you are. Um, you can continue to use your land just as you would like to be able to do that. And in fact, I will protect you. And so, uh, so if somebody comes to you as a threat, I will send my armies to defend you. So you'll be better off having a relationship with me. Uh, but there are some stipulations about that, some, some expectations that I have about what that agreement would look like. And so, um, so you got to be nice to us. You know, no, you know, if, I, if my troops come around, no harassing them. And this whole thing about kind of sending off to other nations and trying to solicit you know, uh, you know, my enemies to kind of come to your aid, that just ain't going to work. And, uh, and by the way, each year as your crops come in, perhaps you could send a tribute. You know, 10% of your, the produce of your crops send to me and that will help offset some of the expense of some of the things that we're doing in this relationship. And so there would be a sense of this agreement, this covenant that would happen. And oftentimes there was a sacrifice that would happen that would agree the, uh, at, the, at the time of the agreement. And so an animal would be sacrificed to kind of seal the deal. But also, which is where the, the term to cut for, comes from, to cut the sacrifice. Uh, but there is also would be a, a part of the agreement would be that there would be um, stipulations or requirements, um, as we just talked about. But if you violated those agreements, if you violated those stipulations, then there would be judgment that would happen. There would be, um, so if you reached out to some of my enemies or if you refused to send the tribute, then my armies are going to come in and they will enforce it. And so maybe you'll lose some of your people to slavery or there will be some kind of a, of a more drastic um, a price that you'll have to pay. And so there would be a cost, a judgment that would come because of the violations of the stipulations. And then, uh, and then as we go through that judgment that happens, then there's an opportunity. If the nation is still in existence, if it's still there, then the movement towards, uh, towards another, another understanding of this relationship. So, so the desire for a renewed covenant, to be able to come together and how it is that we can, in light of what we've learned, in light of, in light of these, these events, how is it then that we can live together? And so a new covenant um, to be able to be established. So this, 
this, this continuation of the rhythm that happened continually throughout the Old Testament of the offer of a relationship in a covenant, the stipulations of the, what the requirements are of the covenant, the, the tendency of the people to err, to be able to want to go off on their own and to live on their, on their own terms in violation of the covenant, the judgment that comes because of that, and then the offering of a new covenant, a desire to kind of uh, to, to find ways of being able to reconcile so that we can have a relationship uh, in the future. That rhythm happens over and over and over and over again as we look at the Old Testament documents. So I hope as if you've been able to kind of follow along with us, uh, you've been able to begin to see some of that rhythm continue to happen from the first pages of the Old Testament in Genesis and the creation to Noah, to Babel, to, to it'll, it'll happen in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It'll happen with Moses. It'll happen with the prophets later on, with David. Uh, numbers of times in which the covenant uh, continues to form and to continue to flow in that kind of way. Um, so we can see in the lesson for this morning, um, this tremendous, gracious offer that this God of ours has. He's, he, so God creates mankind in his own image, in the image of God he created them. And then it says that he blessed them. And he says, I give to you, um, I give to you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. Let, they, will be your, theirs, um, they will be yours for food and all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground. So there's this tremendous offering of a relationship that God has. He creates us. He wants to have a relationship with us. And then, you know, this whole Garden of Eden thing and the tree and the one thing that they're not supposed to do. And then, of course, what is the one thing that they do do? And then judgment that happens and they're being cast out of the Garden of Eden. And then this desire for finding the terms of another relationship. What does that relationship look like? And, and then it works for a while, and then the airing that happens that leads to the conditions that, for which the flood then eventually comes, and, and Noah and the ark, but then um, following the judgment of God, this tremendous covenant offer that God makes in the beautiful rainbow that appears in the sky, and God's desire to continue to have a relationship that it would not be the destruction of the human race, but it would be continued to, to flow from his love and his generosity with us. So this continued um, rhythm of covenant um, that happens with the people of God. Um, we need, as we continue to walk this out, we need to, to look a little bit at the issue of sin and judgment, don't we? The issue of sin and judgment. Uh, because it's so uncomfortable, isn't it? As you read in the Old Testament, it's the place where we want to balk because it's harsh and it's hard. And it's hard to understand how is it that we can have a God uh, a relationship with a God who can feel so harsh to us. But it's a good thing for us to be able to step back a little bit and to ask ourselves the question about the place of judgment in our lives and to be able to just acknowledge as we look at our lives and the people who are around us and the way that we live, on the one hand, we crave judgment and we also fear it. We crave judgment as something that is necessary in our lives in order for life to be possible, and yet we fear it. So, for instance, um, we crave it because we know that there need to be standards, there need to be conditions upon which life is based. Imagine you're a student in high school or college, and, uh, and there's a paper that's due, and you gotta come and you gotta hand it in to your teacher, your professor on that following day. And so you, you work hard all week, you stay up all night, you slave, you drink coffee, you do everything you can to stay awake, and you work, you pour yourself into this paper. This is the best paper that you've ever written. And you come to class the next day. And, uh, and with all of the other students, you hand in your paper and you're proud of it. Um, but next to you is this schleppy guy who, who has, not been, um, has not been somehow distracted by the need to write this paper at all during the week. And, uh, and just before the class, uh, he pulls out some paper from his binder and scribbles some words on it in his own handwriting, and he hands that in. That's his paper. And so the papers all come to the front, the professor holding them, and the professor says, you know what? I'm feeling particularly generous today. He says, everybody who hands in a paper gets an A. <laughs> oh, see? <laughs> see? We rail against that because we know that there has to be standards, right? 
we know that there has to be a, a, an opportunity to be able to know what the bar is and to be able to achieve it, to be able to move towards it. We know that there has to be truth, that we have to be able to, we have to have the expectation that we speak the truth and we're held accountable if we don't. Um, and if we don't measure up to those standards, that there will be judgment, that there will be consequences to the fact that we have not made, uh, that we have not accomplished the standard. I don't know about you, um, but you may have uh, been following the news uh, this past week about Lance Armstrong. That's been a difficult item in the press, hasn't it been? Over a decade, a guy who has been a cultural leader for us, finally confessing to what he has denied for years and years and years about doping, about his abuse of his body and his intimidation of the, his colleagues, the other athletes who were there who were wanting to come out and wanting to, um, to speak the truth, his suing people who spoke the truth and winning those lawsuits in courts of law, um, his abusing his relationship with his sponsors, and then to, to now hear the confession that, that is coming out. There's something that's just, <laughs> that at the very deepest level for us morally is offended by that, isn't there? And it would be wrong for those who are, that are responsible for standards uh, and, and policies and, the, and the, uh, the upholding those standards for bicycling to come out and say, you know, Lance, you raised a lot of money for us, it's okay. It doesn't matter. You know, let's just all kind of get beyond this and, uh, and go out there and ride your bike for us, would ya? There's something that's wrong about that, right? If that were to be the case, then the whole, the whole industry, the whole opportunity to compete in, in cycling athletics would be in jeopardy. But it's not just cycling, it's baseball too, right? So there was nobody elected to the Hall of Fame this year because of doping, is that right? But it's not just athletics and doping. It is, uh, talk about Wall Street. You can't open the pages of the Wall Street Journal without talking about some hedge fund manager, respectable hedge fund manager, who's been making a tremendous amount of money based on inside information that wasn't available to everyone else. But it's not just finance and it's not just sports. It is teachers who pad their, their students um, SAT scores so that they can look better, right? It's, it goes on and on and on and on, and it includes people who are known in the press and people who aren't. It includes people in high places and the rest of us. And so on the one hand, we crave judgment. We crave standards. We crave to know that somewhere, someplace, there is such a thing as truth and righteousness and justice. But then when the light shines on us, we get nervous and sweaty because we know, don't we? So throughout the history of the first pages of the Old Testament, there is this rhythm of covenant, offering of a relationship, the violation of that covenant, the judgment that comes and the restoration, the desire to see that covenant um, reestablished over and over and over again until finally we get to the pages of the New Testament and we find what is called the New Covenant. The New Covenant. The culmination, the resolution of this tension that happened in this relationship that we have with God and, uh, and the living out of this obligation that we have to be his people that finds its resolution in Jesus Christ who as the very son of God comes and takes on human form and in his life fulfills the standard of justice and righteousness, unlike anyone has ever been able to, fulfills the standard and takes on the punishment of us all and then extends to us not judgment, but grace and mercy and forgiveness and then gives to us the gift of the Holy Spirit that allows for transformation and the power of being able to live lives that are more and more increasingly in accord with these standards that God gives to us. And so as we look at the Old Testament, as we read about Old Testament justice, as we read about the events in the Old Testament, we look at it as the Christian community of faith through the eyes of Jesus. 
with the eyes of Jesus, with him completely in mind. And so for us, uh, we look at the stories there and we see them through the lens of, of what it is that Christ has done for us. I had a friend who was a colleague, um, a priest in a former church um, in, in Philadelphia. He was a young priest, um, fairly conservative in his demeanor and his way of being able to operate. And, uh, and, um, and he came uh, to uh, work one day um, wearing a, a, a regular um, shirt um, that was pretty flaming pink. Now, I have nothing against flaming pink shirts. That's great. But to see a fairly conservative young guy who's a priest come into the office wearing a pretty flaming pink shirt, that just kind of caught our attention, knowing who he was and what he did. So eventually, I just couldn't help myself. And... and <laughs> So went up to him and said, hey, John, um, I like your shirt. And he said, well, thank you very much. He said, I said, um, you look good in pink. And his face just completely changed. It went red. And, and he fumbled, and he kind of you know, uh, was looking for his words. And then he confessed. He said, you know, he said, I, I'm colorblind. <laughs> and uh, my wife, Alicia, um, went to visit her parents, and so wasn't here. Normally, she inspects what I put on before I leave the house, and so she wasn't here to do that, and so I, I dressed myself. Um, so, so from that time on, um, whenever he would come in wearing two socks of the different color or, pa or pants and, and shirt that didn't quite match, we'd say, or I would say to him, John, I guess Alicia must be gone this week, eh? <laughs> So you know about color blindness. You know that it's a genetic condition and that there's something that happens with our iris. There's a gene that's missing. And, uh, and so you can't perceive the full range of colors um, that are out there in front of us. And so the danger is uh, that for us, as we read the Old Testament, if we read it just from an Old Testament lens, we see the kind of black and white of the human events of this continuing covenant um, rhythm that happened. But with the coming of the new covenant, with the coming of Jesus Christ, all of a sudden, we have the opportunity to be able to see in color. So we don't, look, we don't need in our eyes another gene. We need Jesus in our eye. We need to be able to see things with Jesus that allows the text, the stories, the covenants of the Old Testament to, to, to jump to life and to see the full color, the drama, of what it is that God's redemption has accomplished in and through us. And so when we look at the Old Testament, in the very first pages, it says, the very first um, uh, verse of, of Genesis 1-1 was, in the beginning God created. But we can't read that without hearing the first uh, verse of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So from the very beginning, Jesus himself was there. We can't read the story of Noah and the ark and the flood without thinking about the waters of baptism that wash us clean and bring us fresh into the presence of a God who cares for us. We can't read the story of the Tower of Babel and the confusion of the languages without thinking about the gift of the Holy Spirit and the opportunity of the Holy Spirit to bring us together, even though we seem divided and divisive. There's the opportunity for God's Spirit to be able to bring us together from different cultures and, race and races and creeds to be able to come together and to worship him as his people. We come to be able to see the story of God's passionate love for us, as mind-blowing as it is. The creator of the universe wanting to have a relationship with you to be his people, to be touched by him, to be transformed by him, to receive his love, and to live 